Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Programmable Pumps for Compound Delivery in Oncology Research. This webinar has been sponsored by iPressio Microinfusion Pumps, so a big thank you to them for helping to make this event possible. Joining us today, we're very fortunate to have Christian Schnell, Associate Director of Oncology at Novartis in Basel. His presentation will discuss his work involving implantable infusion pump studies in rodents and the advancement of pharmacological interventions in oncology research. So take it away whenever you're ready. With pleasure. So what I would like to share with you today is our experience we have made over the, let's say, past two to three years uh, using programmable pumps uh, for compound delivery in the frame of oncology research. and. Um, I think one of the first question which we have to face, uh, at least in preclinical uh, studies, and especially since the early 80s when we moved uh, from cytotoxics to uh, targeted therapy, is really uh, to find out that the primary objective for an oncology drug, which we would like to, to design, uh, is to understand the target coverage, which is required to achieve the desired anti-tumor therapeutic efficacy. It's a very simple uh, sentence, but there is a lot behind and a lot of work. Um, so, the, let's say, standard or traditional way of achieving, uh, hopefully, the right response to this question is to use a so-called PKPD modeling, uh, which is simply based on the fact that uh, you have a causal relationship between exposure of your compound the target inhibition, which is a resultant of that, and obviously, hopefully at the end, the anti-tumor therapeutic activity, which was, uh, let's say, find out early on using uh, in vitro uh, tests. The way this is done uh, is illustrated on this slide on the left with a very simple graph. So normally what you do is that uh, you put on the x-axis uh, the time, uh, after the injection of your drug, is it IV, is it subcut, or is it PO? Most of the time it is PO, at least in oncology, because we want to treat our patients with a pill afterwards. Uh, you are using one single dose. Uh, you select the relevant matrix uh, to really uh, uh, get the, uh, the PK. Most of the time, in this case, it's, it's plasma, because this is what you can translate to, to the human situation. Uh, you monitor a single PD biomarker. Obviously, this biomarker needs to be relevant, sensitive, and reproducible. Uh, and then you can have this nice shape on, um, on the left. You can see you have an increase in your PK profile with a, a max here after one hour. Um, and uh, you can, at the same time, uh, look on your PD marker, which in this case uh, is basically 95% uh, inhibited, uh, as it should be if the compound is working properly. And then you see that you have a decay uh, in the PK over time. And and as a result, your PD goes up again. So that's a very uh, simple way, but already very informative on how your compound behaves. Um, in order really to get a sense on uh, the PKPD efficacy relationship, what you need to do then is really to have a, a plot like here on the left, where in this case, you put the plasma levels, which you have measured at steady state, mostly here uh, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you have the PD response, which is then expressed in percentage inhibition. And uh, this is the reason why it's very important in such studies to include a vehicle treated group, because this is basically your 100%, your reference. Um, you have to, uh, obviously, to analyze the PK and the PD from the same sample or from the same time point from the same animal. You need, and this is quite important, a good dynamic range, meaning you need a dose which was ineffective and you need a dose which was fully effective in order to be able to have a very nice S-line curve, as you can see here uh, on the left. Uh, and in order to get to this, uh, obviously, and I think I don't have to convince you, uh, it needs a lot of time points, it needs a lot of animals in order really to be sure that the IC50, meaning the concentration needed in the plasma to get a 50% inhibition of your target, or the IC80, which is an giving you 80% inhibition of the target is achieved. We know from experience that most of the uh, time in oncology, in order to get efficacy, we have to be at least over 80% uh, target inhibition. 
Once you have done that, uh, you can then go back to your PK uh, curve, which you can see here now on the right, and you can just draw a line with this IC80, and you can calculate uh, between two consecutive treatments how long is my PK exposure in plasma over this threshold of IC80. Uh, and this gives you a value. In this case, in this example, you see it's basically uh, 0.6 or so 60% of the time we have a uh, target inhibition, which is over 80%. Once you have this data, you can go to the next uh, exercise where you try to correlate this now with the anti-tumor efficacy. And uh, just to explain you how we do this experiment in oncology, on the right, you can see that we have, again, time of treatment. So most of the time here, it's a daily treatment. And you have on the y-axis a tumor volume, which you measure with a caliper. Um, and you can see that uh, the vehicle treated, which is here in, in, in the circle, they grow with time, because this is what, unfortunately, uh, tumor cells are doing. They grow and grow and grow and never stop. and uh, then you have the different the compound at three different doses, which you can see here. And you have then, obviously, a dose which is intermediate uh, active. Then you have a, a stasis where uh, basically the line didn't change from beginning to, to day eight. And then if you have a good compound in the best possible world, what you will see then is a, a regression, meaning that your tumor gets uh, smaller. So by doing so, what you can do now, you can, again, on the right, plot uh, uh, the results in such a way that you have on the x-axis uh, the time over IC80, and then on the y-axis the corresponding efficacy. And then you can get such nice curves where you can see that in this case, in order to get stasis, uh, as I say, this is when the tumor is not growing, it's just under control, which is already a big achievement for our patients. You see that we have to be around 25% of the time over this IC80 between two consecutive treatments. Obviously, if you want to go to aggression, which is much better, obviously, for, for the patients, uh, and most of the time what the clinician likes to see is a 50% uh, tumor shrinkage, you see that in this case, we have to be nearly 92% of the time over the target. So it's very challenging. So there is a clear difference between stasis and regression. It's a very big hurdle to go to the regression situation in oncology. So all is good. This is easy to do. It needs time. It needs animal. Um, you have to understand the mechanism of action. Thanks to this approach, you know what is the percentage of uh, target emission you need to get efficacy. Uh, it will allow you to select, hopefully, the optimal compound. It will shorten the development time. You can then estimate the therapeutic index. That's something I will address a little bit later in the talk. Uh, and definitely, hopefully, uh, it will better predict the dose range in early clinical testing, because this is the aim of all our preclinical activities, is to be able to say, look, this is the dose you have to use to go to the, to the patients, and we expect that under these conditions, uh, the, the compound will be effective. Obviously, there are some caveats in everything. And one of the biggest caveats, which uh, is uh, clear, I think, to most of us, is that you have a variability which is associated with such an approach. The variability is first uh, can come from the PK, meaning that you have different absorption profile per animal. Uh, you can have variability in your PD, so basically the expression of the target in your tumor. It can be different from one animal to another, to one size of, an, of the tumor to another, because we know that tumors are really characterized with heterogeneity. Um, and also within each study, this is a possible concern. One other one, which is very important here, and this is a temporal delay in the PD effect, meaning this hysteresis, because we don't know if the uh, exposure which you will have in your plasma, which hopefully will translate into tumor exposure, will then also uh, have an effect on the PD uh, right away, or maybe there is a two hours delay or three hours. Nobody is really going to tell you that. So that's something you will have to sense and to find out. Not an easy task. Uh, we, you have to use pool data uh, to really get to the numbers, which is significant to get a statistical outcome. And as a consequence, as highlighted here, uh, there's a high number of animals which is needed uh, to achieve that. And this is then a three-year uh, question, which I'm going to, to address uh, during this talk. So what are possible alternatives? And one alternative uh, is basically to use a parenteral drug delivery technology, um, assuming, at least on paper, that under these conditions, you will have less viability uh, associated with the PK, because obviously you will bypass uh, the tomac and you will just go directly either to, uh, to IV, uh, basically in your blood, or 
via a subcutaneous uh, infusion if the compound is absorbed. You will have no temporal delay because you will start your infusion and you will go to a steady state or you can even say okay i'm waiting for two days uh, in order to get your pd uh, and as a result and hopefully uh, you will end up with uh, a lower number of animals needed to achieve uh, these statistically significant results so in addition to that and this is the reason why i highlighted this in red you should also be able to explore different degrees of sustained target engagement uh, and really get a very good impression on what is really needed to drive anti-tumor efficacy. Um, and this is also going to facilitate the validation of novel targets. Uh, keep in mind that we have presently uh, nearly 80% attrition rate uh, of compounds which are entering the clinic for oncology, uh, meaning there is a lot to do. I think uh, the preclinical data which we are gaining are certainly good, but uh, definitely they could be better. So um, we decided at Novartis to, 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 to enter in this endeavor, uh, as I say, two to three years ago, uh, using uh, one possible pump, which was on the market, which is Iprezio. Um, and we have used this in two different species, in rat and mice. The rat, uh, we have used the SMP200, which is, you can see here. Uh, important to notice uh, is that this pump needs to be pre-programmed before you implant them in the animal, which is limiting a little bit uh, the flexibility in terms of reaction to what you see in, in your in vivo experiment but nevertheless it's already a, a, a very nice uh, tool to use and uh, most importantly as you can see here you have also this uh, resealable septum meaning that you can refill your pump uh, up to uh, more than thousand times um, meaning that you can refill your pump every day which is also going to solve a lot of the problems if you have a compound which is not highly soluble um, and so on so it, it gives you quite a lot of flexibility here um, and then uh, the way we have done the implantation is very straightforward, as the, uh, described in the in, in the textbook, if you want. So we are we have used jugular vein infusion. Uh, what we have seen is that by in introducing a little loop, as you can see here on the left uh, in, in, in red, this uh, was quite profitable in terms of uh, succeed of uh, the implantation uh, due to the fact that there is no tension when the animal is moving around uh, with the head or the body uh, on the entry point in your uh, jugular vein. So uh, this was is quite easy to do, uh, but it can have uh, very uh, important consequences at the end. The way we have have uh, done the, in, in, uh, the insertion in the jugular vein is described here in the middle, uh, again straightforward. Maybe important to notice is that we have found out that uh, distance of insertion of the catheter around 1.5 centimeters seems to be optimal uh, in, in, in rats. Uh, we have also used an approach where we have two pre-ligature, uh, the, the two ligatures together. Uh, this was also uh, helpful uh, to, to, to really uh, uh, ensure 100% success rate. Uh, we have done the same in mice using the smallest pump, the SMP310R, as you can see. And here I think a big improvement, obviously, is that you can program your pump during the experiment when it's implanted in vivo. And this gives you, again, as I mentioned before, quite a, a very nice uh, flexibility, which I'm going to, to, to talk about uh, during the talk a little bit later. So here again, the implantation is, uh, is uh, as, as described, again, the jugular vein. Uh, so far, we have performed uh, nearly 180 uh, iPrezzo surgeries, mice and rats together, obviously. Uh, what we have uh, found out is that two mice and six rats uh, were able to reach and section the catheter in the neck area, basically where uh, we have done uh, the insertion, which is around 4%. And the lesson learned here, and also a message for you, is that a daily checkup is quite important, especially at the beginning after the surgery, but also during the experiment, because the animals uh, can manage. They are quite uh, cute, isn't it? They can manage to go to the, to the insertion point, uh, maybe to open the nuts and, and then to go to the catheter and, and, and to bite it through. But it's very, very seldom, as you can see, but uh, important to be noticed as a possible um, problem. 
So when we started, obviously, we wanted to be convinced that these pumps are really delivering uh, and doing the job as uh, described uh, in the notice. So we, uh, what we did here is that uh, we uh, refilled the pump uh, on a daily basis. The pump was set up for uh, four microliter per hour. This is uh, 310 R in mice. And um, by refilling the pump every day, you can count how much you have to refill in the septum. Um, and then you can calculate uh, how much uh, compound was delivered from the pump uh, per hour. Um, and uh, what you can see, these are the results on the right. So the pump, as I say, was designed programmed for four microliters per hour. And this is what we measured in uh, the orange dots. And you see we are really, really consistent over 10 days of daily refilling. So the pump was really uh, doing the job as, as expected uh, from the program. Um, the second uh, validation study, which we decided to do, is really to say, OK, can we really, using the appraiser pump, infuse a compound at a certain rate and get at steady state, the concentration which we expect to have. And this is easy to do or to calculate just by using uh, the form formula, which is on, on in, in highlighted in red, basically that the infusion rate should uh, be the, the, the sum of uh, the concentration of steady state uh, times the clearance. Um, but this means that the clearance needs to be accurate in order to test the pump. So what we decided to do, and very often uh, in, in preclinical studies, uh, you have your PK uh, department, which is giving you the clearance of your compound. This is based on an IV single dose bolus. Um, and uh, you take this value as granted because there's no other choice. And this is normally how it works very nicely. But we decided uh, to go one step further and to validate this clearance um, the IV using uh, a, a, an infusion, but ha having uh, this system which maybe some of you are aware is this uh, automated blood sampling system where you uh, implant the catheter in, in the rat, uh, in this case, uh, in the jugular vein also. And uh, you have uh, also uh, a femoral vein where you can do the infusion of your compound. Uh, then the animal is basically connected to a swivel, as you can see on the left. The animal is freely moving in this cage, but Obviously, he's isolated. And then using the pump on the top, you can program uh, to take blood at any time of the day, any volume you want, um, using an external pump. So this is how we did it. And uh, with a compound A, uh, we tested at three different infusion rates. And we basically compared the predicted concentration of steady state using the clearance which was given to us by our colleagues from PKS, and then what we could uh, measure in the in in the plasma, and this is now highlighted on on the right here. So you see in uh, in green these are the predicted uh, concentration at steady state, and in orange the observed one. And you see we have a really good correlation. So uh, the PKS colleagues did a really good job, and the clearance uh, which was given for this compound is absolutely accurate, and it's in this case 11.5 mL per minute per kilogram. So at least we have one variable less to enter the uh, let's say, validation study with the pump. We know the clearance is right. And uh, so what we decided to do, uh, first to start in rats, we took the SMP200. We took uh, five different uh, dose concentration in the pump, uh, ranging from 2 to 15 milligrams per milliliter. And we selected two different infusion rates, either 20 microliter per hour or 16. And on the right, we did the same exercise. So on the x-axis, you have the predicted blood levels based on the clearance, which we have validated just before. And on the y-axis, the observed blood levels at steady state. And you see that here we have done this uh, at, with five different doses. And you see we have a really good correlation. I think that was quite we were quite happy with that. So this is with uh, compound A. Obviously, one, N equal 1 is never enough. So we went to a second compound, compound B. Here, the dose was lower. Uh, we changed it uh, up to, uh, I think, nearly uh, eight different uh, uh, doses, uh, concentration. And the infusion rate was lower, so 4 microliter per hour, just to show that uh, the pump will deliver as accordingly with high rates, but also with low infusion rates. And you can see on the right uh, the, the graph, again, uh, a really, really good um, overlap between the predicted and the observed uh, 
concentration at steady state. Uh, in addition, uh, because this is very often also used in preclinical studies, uh, this, we are using the osmotic uh, ALZ pumps. Obviously, the caveat here is that you can only fill them once, once they're in, they're in, uh, meaning you need a compound with a good solubility to be able to, to use them. But in this case, with this compound, it was possible. So we went to a 10 mix per milliliter uh, concentration, uh, very low infusion rate in order to get a two weeks delivery with the pump. And on the right, you can see that these are not the values obtained with the ALZ pump in orange. Uh, which aligns very nicely with the Iprezio uh, readouts. Uh, obviously, then uh, we decided to switch to mice um, as a second uh, species. And here we use uh, the, the smaller pump, the 310R. And you can see here again three different uh, uh, conditions so, two different doses, two different diffusion rates. Uh, the same compound as you showed uh, the first one in rats, so it works very nicely also in uh, in mice. Another compound, compound B, the, again the same as compound B in rats, works really really nicely also in uh, in mice again with an infusion rate of four microliter, very low dose as you can see, 0.2 milligrams per milliliter. Uh, and then we add in mice a third one, uh, which as you can see again a very nice correlation. So. With all this validation study, we were able to produce this graph, which I think is quite impressive. So uh, this is now using two different species, mice and rats, two different pumps, three different tool compounds, 24 different doses, seven different infusion rates ranging from two to 20 microliter per hour. And you see that the correlation between the predicted levels based on the clearance, which was given by our PKS colleagues uh, and the observed fits really nicely. So I think we were quite happy to see that we could really use this uh, and trust this pump to really assess now uh, PD and efficacy relationship uh, with this approach. So, as I say, now the important part is to see if we get to a certain steady state level with the pump, do we really see also the antitumor efficacy? Because this is the unknown. This is a variable we want to know in order to predict what we are going to do in the clinic. So again, this is what I already showed you. So we are using rats here with a tumor sitting subcutaneously. It's a human tumor in nude rats. This is the reason why the rat has no hairs. Uh, there is basically no immune system in this, uh, in this animal, which allows you to have a human tumor, which will then grow on this background. And and then we have implanted the impresso pump on the back, as you can see here. And uh, we started now to do different infusions, and then we could draw a very nice curve, as you can see on the right. Basically, on the y-axis, we have the compound uh, uh, plasma levels at steady state, and on the x-axis, we have the efficacy. Again, remember what I told you before, uh, stasis is nice to have, as you can see here, uh, which then would need a steady state concentration of 0 0.5 micromolar per liter, but in order to get to 50% tumor shrinkage, which is obviously the, a, the goal uh, for our patients, you see that we would have to basically double the concentration at steady state around 1.5 micromolar for this compound. Once you have that, you can then see if you this correlates well with the real PD inhibition in your tumor because if your assumption is right the PD inhibition should translate in anti-tumor efficacy if not then you have an off target which you don't want for any kind of compound so what we did then is that we took the tumors out um, and we correlated the plasma concentration on the x-axis with the tumor PD inhibition and then you can get such a nice curve as you can see here be basically telling you that uh, in order to get stasis where we could clearly see that we would need around 0 0.7 micromolar per liter, you see that at this level, we have only 50% target inhibition. In order to get to regression, meaning this 1.5 micromolar per liter, you need that we are around basically uh, 70 to 72% uh, target inhibition. It's quite clear that if you would go to a more severe target inhibition, you should, according to the uh, graph on the left, go to even stronger regression, uh, up to 80%, which obviously is, is a holy Braille here. So using this approach, we were able uh, to definitely demonstrate that for a compound IA, in this case, the anti-tumor activity is uh, sweet trough driven, meaning uh, the lowest uh, constant exposure the tumor will see over time and not the Cmax, uh, which was basically uh, in the old time uh, what the cytotoxic were doing. I think you needed to be as high as possible to kill the cells. In our case, because it's targeted, it's a different uh, approach and it's really Cref.
So we have done the same exercise uh, with another uh, tumor, but uh, in mice with the same compound. And you see that by infusing uh, the compound uh, with the apresio pump, uh, the prediction for uh, plasma levels versus uh, efficacy fitted very nicely. So the mice data align very nicely with, uh, with the rat. And most importantly, if we do the same exercise of um, exposure versus PD, you can see that the mice data, which are here now in red, align very nicely with the rat data. So we have the same inhibition of the target, which then will result in the same efficacy in your tumor, which makes perfect sense. So that, that was also very reassuring to see that this works very nicely in two different species, two different tumor models using uh, the infusion. So that's all fine, all good. Uh, but one of the key, uh, let's say, hurdle which we have in, in, in oncology is not only to get a, a compound which is active, but most importantly, a compound which is tolerated. You might remember that very often, uh, at least in the old days, with the uh, cytotoxic, it was active uh, when it was already toxic. So that was a problem with the patients. And then you had to put some drug holidays in between so that the patients could recover. But with the targeted therapy, uh, the aim is really to get a really good TI, meaning that your compound should be active and not toxic at all, only at much higher dose, which are maybe not needed to get full efficacy. So at least that's, that's the paradigm which we are following. Um, and uh, the way we are Calculating this therapeutic index is highlighted on this cartoon here. You do this uh, relationship between uh, the 50% inhibition of your target, as I already showed you several times, which give you a certain value. And then you have a toxic effect, which give you another value. And then it's definitely these two lines should be apart the most possible in order to get a very safe uh, compound. So that's the aim. And um, this is feasible to, to be done with oral treatment. But obviously, one of the biggest caveats which we have is that uh, given the PK profile or oral dose, you have a high Cmax, as you can see here, then it goes down, and then it goes basically to zero before you start to retreat. And uh, the three different zones where we want to be is obviously not uh, the lower one, because then you have no activity. The upper one is not good because you have tox. So you want to be in this middle range, the so-called sweet spot. Um, and uh, you can see that if you do oral dosing, you are in this range for a very short time. So is this really going to give you a, a, a good information about the therapeutic index or the tolerability of your, of your compound, knowing that most of the time, such kind of PK profile after PO in a rodents are not translatable to humans. They are going to be a little bit different there. So it's, it's a little bit tricky to really find out the right way of doing this time of a, a threshold for, for the toxicity. And we thought that using uh, the pump delivery, we are in a much, much easier and easier world because we can really just just tune uh, our uh, infusion rate at steady state uh, from one zone to the other. And we don't have to go to the toxic or just at the edge of the toxic, but we can then clearly see, ah, uh, this is now my therapeutic range, which as you know, we have seen already with the PD inhibition. And then we can say, look, at perfect inhibition of the target, we have no tox and tox started after a certain exposure. So the protocol we have used is a very simple and straightforward one and is uh, described here. So what we did at day zero after uh, the pump in, uh, implantation and recovery of the animals, we started to infuse a compound at a low uh, dose, 0 0.2 mix per milliliter at four microliter per hour for four days, because then we know we have really steady state, we have a rich equilibrium. And uh, one tox readout, as you might know, is definitely body weight. Uh, it's very crude, but at least it shows you the animal tolerated or not at all. So you can see that there is no body weight change at this dose and we increase the dose just by changing uh, inside the pump the concentration to 0 0.3 which is here then in yellow no tox effect then we went to 0 0.6 doubling no tox effect we went even to another uh, doubling uh, step 1.2 uh, you see there is no uh, tox effect on, on on body weight and interestingly you can see on the on the lower part now these are the pk data which we uh, took from blood taken at steady state at, at, at four days after in, uh, in constant infusion and you, has, you can see a very nice dose dependency. So you would say, okay, this is perfect. I think this compound is very well tolerated. However, uh, at least for this compound, one of the side effects which we knew uh, is going to happen is hyperglycemia. So basically, the 
animals and also the patients could have a risk to become diabetic under uh, a treatment, which is not what you want to achieve. So what we decided to do is at the same time as uh, we are using body weight, blood levels for exposure, we are also measuring the glucose in, uh, in the blood using uh, the same device as all the diabetic patients on Earth are using nowadays, which is uh, uh, this little uh, uh, system here, uh, this glucometer. Uh, it needs only uh, two microliters of blood, so very, very tiny. You just have to, to, to bleed uh, the tail of your, of your animal, and, and you can get this readout. Uh, and then you can correlate these blood uh, glucose values with the, with the PK. And uh, this is then what you can see here on this graph. So you see now that under the conditions of the 0 0.203 or 0 0.6 uh, uh, infusion rate, we have a little increase, but it's definitely not of a grade two, which starts to be, let's say, problematic uh, in the clinic. But you see that when we push uh, from 0 0.6 to 1.2, we start to see a very severe hyperglycemia. So this is definitely uh, a tox dose, which we don't want to go. And uh, in addition, as you know, uh, glucose is under control in healthy uh, patients and obviously also in our animals uh, using the insulin to counteract for the hyperglycemia. And you see that insulin obviously will increase much earlier than glucose because it's able to do the job basically to keeping uh, the glucose under control by increasing the reabsorption in muscle uh, and, and fat tissue. But you see that as this high dose of 1.2, even with a tremendous increase in insulin from basically 0 0.5 to 10, uh, the body in this case, uh, the rat is not able to compensate for that. So we have a clear insulin resistance, meaning uh, a diabetic uh, type 2 uh, situation here. Very important to notice is that this data were obtained with n equal to only two uh, rats. And I hope you can appreciate uh, the small um, uh, variability which we can see from one, one rat to another. And this is one of the assumptions which we had, if you remember at slide three, that the variability will be less by using parental delivery versus oral. And I think uh, at least based on this compound, and we have also other examples, uh, the variability is really low, uh, which will allow you to get a good feeling on, uh, let's say, uh, the maximum tolerate dose with a, a reduced number of, of animals. Once you have done that, we can go back to a very similar exercise on the right. We have the x-axis, again, plasma levels as usual. But now on the y-axis, we just put the glucose levels, which we have measured on the tail vein. And here, then, normally you get such a curve, meaning that up to 5 uh, micromole per liter, you see that we are still in the so-called green zone. So grade 1, uh, there is an increase, but it's not something you have to worry too much about. But as soon as you go to grade 2, which is really going to um, initiate a treatment with anti-diabetic medication in our patients, uh, you see that this is happening after five micromolar. And now to calculate the TI, this is very, very easy. You just divide the, uh, the dose you need to go to this grade two, so not what you want, by, via the dose you need to have 50% tumor regression, 1.5, meaning that for this compound, the uh, TI or the therapeutic index is 3.3 which I have to say is, is quite good for, uh, for oncology. So what is the future? I think uh, that's all good, but um, we should also think to combine approaches, to combine technology, uh, because this makes our life exciting, isn't it? And um, what you can see here is that we decided to use a pump uh, together with a uh, radio telemetry approach. Why radio telemetry? Because as I say, there is a sensor on the market which can sense the glucose in your blood uh, every second if you want. And then the signal is sent out via a radio wave to a receiver, which you just have underneath your cage of your animal. And this signal then will be de deconvoluted in, uh, in, in glucose levels. So you have an online readout of your hyperglycemia in your animal. And at the same time, you have your uh, compound in your pump, which you can 
bottle rate or change at any time. Uh, and uh, obviously, what we could do then is under these conditions, you can just look on your PC, on your screen. Here you have the blood glucose levels, as I say, every minute a measurement, day and night. Very important because all the data which are normally collected in animals are collected during the day of our day, meaning when the animals are sleeping because they are nocturnal. So we are missing a lot of information of hyperglycemia if we don't measure our animals during the active phase when they eat, which is day and night. And obviously we are not there. So with the telemetry, we are not going to lose any uh, information. And in addition, what we can do then is that using uh, the SMP uh, 310R uh, here, we can just tune uh, during the experiment when the pump is implanted, when the tumor is growing, when the glucose is changing in your animal, you can just change either the infusion rate, uh, you can stop, you can restart. So basically, I'm always saying to my students, you, you are sitting on your desk and you have two joysticks and you can play right, left, it's up to you to find the right protocol, but it's very easy and straightforward in a non-stressed animal, easy to mention, and most importantly, in a group host animals. So that's uh, very important to, 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 to notice. So uh, as I say, there are also caveats uh, in this approach using the parental delivery versus a pump. Uh, the first one is that the steady state obviously should be achieved rapidly. If you have a steady state which would need three weeks, obviously, uh, then the battery is already off. So that's not something which is easy to use. So if possible, uh, a compound which achieves steady state concentration early, happily or luckily in oncology, we have most of our compounds which will achieve steady state uh, after one or two days. So that's not, not a problem. One of the big hurdles is still the case. You need solubility. I think you cannot infuse a stone. That will never happen in the future. Uh, and it needs to be stable at 37 degrees, which is also important. Very often for oral, you can put your drug in the fridge and you just take it out before you, you dose the animals and then it goes back in the fridge. In this case, it will be sitting on the back of your animal for all the time, meaning around 7, uh, 37 degree uh, Celsius here. Uh, the infusion rate should be acceptable with the species. So you cannot infuse 100 microliter per hour in, in a mice. That makes sense to everybody. Uh, and obviously, the duration of the infusion is going to be pivotal, especially due to the battery life. So here, I hope that maybe in the future, with the technology nowadays, it would be possible to re recharge the pump once the pumps are on the animals uh, using a transponder system or whatsoever. That's music for the future, but uh, possibly we will be uh, nicely surprised that this is coming in, in, in at, at once. So uh, summary in conclusion, I think we have clearly highly, uh, we have really invested a lot of time to validate the pump uh, because we really wanted to be sure that what we are going to see in terms of anti-tumor efficacy with the compound is real and not due to uh, some variables in, in, the, in the pump. Um, we have really seen unprecedented PKP correlations. I hope you could appreciate this from my, from my slides. Uh, we've corresponded with very nice anti-tumor activity with the compound I showed you. Uh, and most importantly, here highlighted in red, this is feasible in group housed animals, which was not the case. Um, Obviously, uh, if, if you use another approach um, where you have this uh, automatic blood sampling system where the animal is uh, connected to a, to a, by the teeter to a swirl, then you have to isolate your animals. And I'm going to tell you, at least in Switzerland, and I'm sure it's going also to be the case in other countries, the swirls are going to be more and more important in uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, especially because there is a big pressure uh, from our home office, which is related to the public. I think there is a really, really big initiatives, especially in Switzerland, as I say, uh, to reduce the number of animals and, uh, and, and to accept vivisection and animal experimentation. So I think everything we can do in the right direction uh, should, be, should be done. Uh, so in addition, and I hope I could highlight this at the end uh, and maybe suscitate an appetite that we should not only think uh, in, a, in a one way with one system, but the future is a combination of different complementary technologies. I just showed you one here, which is telemetry, because this is a tool I have in my lab over, over basically 40 years now. So that's something which was quite easy for me to, to, to combine. But I think the, the, 
bringing these two pieces together uh, definitely will lead to improved therapies in the clinic. And most importantly, I think that's my credo to enhance the translatability. I, I'm not happy with the situation where we deliver compound in the clinic. The patients are, hope, are really, really grateful and they are seeking for something which works. And then at the end of the day, we have to disappoint them by saying, sorry, uh, the preclinical data were not uh, predictive for your, for your cancer. That's not what I want. Uh, obviously, Animal instrumentation will always be a model, but uh, I think everything we can, let's say, do better, um, and which on a common sense basis is going to in increase the transitivity, should be done. That's that's definitely my my how I'm convinced about um, uh, doing uh, preclinical work. And I think that was basically the presentation. So thank you for everything, for your time, and uh, happy to take questions. All right. So Christian, if you're ready, the first question for the Q&A is for you. Um, this person has asked, how long is the recommended surgery recovery time? So I think uh, you have to discriminate between rats and mice. Um, I think what we have uh, done, and I have to say with, with, a, with a great success, is that in uh, in mice, we are waiting three to four days uh, before uh, we can, first of all, put the animal together again uh, so that they are not, uh, let's say, opening the knots or, or from one to, to the other. In rats, uh, it, at least in our experience, it took a little bit longer, so we waited five days. Uh, but I would say this is uh, the time frame between three and five days. Okay, perfect. Um, the next question here is, have you used high viscosity formulations with programmable pumps and do they work well? Uh, so far, I think we were lucky uh, to use, uh, let's say, most of the time, um, solutions which are not viscous as the viscous i have used and I, this was on one of the of the slide was 20 percent cyclodextrin so that was the highest i have used so far but uh, i'm sure uh, there are some experience outside uh, novartis uh, with the pumps that maybe other people are using higher viscosity and i'm sure uh, tung can certainly uh, give you some input on that okay great um there's another question here that is asking, um, is there any difficulty with low solubility compounds and complex formulations? Do you have any recommendations to make sure that drug doses um, don't crash out of solution? Okay, so my, my recommendation is quite easy. Ask the chemist to do the right compounds which are soluble. <laughs> so that's easy to say, uh, but obviously not reality. So um, I think one one way we have, uh, we have choose to go is really to have some experts helping you. I think uh, uh, some um, formulation people, uh, this is their job to really find out the best um, uh, media to, to solubilize your, your compound. And uh, especially uh, working hand in hand to tell them, look, this is more or less the concentration I would like to be because this is what I would at least based on the in vitro data expect to see some efficacy so that's something I definitely need uh, you don't have to go higher uh, this is not going to help us a lot so that's really um, a daily interaction with them until uh, they found the, the optimal um, media if you want uh, or vehicle to to to, to this dissolve your compound but it, it's going to be a, a challenge uh, from one compound to another uh, i think that's obviously our daily life um, and uh, you will also get to a stage where you will have compounds which obviously will not fit uh, in a parental delivery or in, in a pump. Um, I just hope that at the end of the day, it's not going to be a high percentage um, and that you should really use the pumps, as I say, for the compound, which are hopefully uh, compatible with, uh, with such an approach. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So we have a question here. Well, first it's a comment. It says, thank you for the great talk. Um, the question yeah. is, can you combine the iPressio pump with telemetry and glucose probes that are implanted? Um, it would, would it be a problem for a mouse to support the weight of all of this equipment? 
that's a really good question also, especially in, in, in light of the three Earls. I, I have to say in mice, I would be reluctant to do it. Uh, that's just too much in terms of weight they will have on their back uh, uh, to, to, to move around. I think that's the reason why we have decided to do this approach in rats. Uh, these are all the data I showed you. Uh, these are real data. Uh, and I can tell you that the rats tolerate this really, really well. Uh, there is no problem to have the telemetry uh, transmitter implanted intraperitoneally with uh, the leuco sensor in the aorta and at the same time an iPrezo pump on the back uh, with an IV infusion. That works really, really, really well. Uh, nevertheless, as I said, I would be really reluctant to do this uh, in mice. And I'm not sure that the home office would, would allow you to do that. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. All right. There's another question here about um, location of the pump. So this person has asked, um, which part of the body should the mini pump be implanted in, in order to reduce um, or avoid impairment of the animal's locomotion and welfare? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question and, and, and really precise. Um, I think according to uh, what we decided to do at the beginning, and this was a little bit according to the textbooks, was to have uh, the pump implanted on the scapula, which is basically on the on the back uh, of your of your animal. Um, what we very rapidly discovered is that over time the pump will not stay there and it will slip on the side on the flank, either right or left. Uh, in our case, it's quite important because. As you have seen in the in one of the slides, we have the tumor implanted subcutaneously on one flank of the animal. So we don't want to have the pump uh, collating with uh, the tumor at the same time. This would be a mess. So what we decided to do then upfront is to say, look, let's implant the pump on the opposite flank, uh, which anyway, the pump will go with time. Um, and what we very easily saw is that uh, in, as I say, with these 200 implantation, the animal locomotion is not impaired at all. So they, they can handle that really, really well. Um, and it's in addition, uh, even easier uh, than trying to, to, to put them on the scapula where you have to fix them with knots. Um, that takes time. And as you know, uh, if you want to have uh, surgery with the biggest uh, success rate possible, one of the key element is reduce the time of the surgery. Um, so everything which prolongs surgery will be deleterious for your animal. So I think there is a win-win here. It's easier, it's better for the animal, and the pump in any way goes there. So just do it from right away. Okay, fantastic suggestions there. Um, another question here, this person has asked, can you apply this continuous, well-controlled administration using these pumps directly to tumors, like intratumoral, for example, in a brain tumor? What a great idea. <laughs> yes, obviously, this is feasible. I think we have used uh, this, um, and this was presented in one of my previous uh, webinars a few years ago, when we used this pump for intracranial infusion of a compound directly uh, at the level where the tumors were sit uh, in uh, these uh, glioblastoma tumors in, in the brain. And uh, we could clearly see that this was a tremendous benefit in terms of anti-tumor efficacy versus an oral dosing. Why? Because obviously the compound didn't have to cross the BBB, blood-brain barrier, and it could really act directly on the tumor cells where it should. So yes, uh, this is feasible. And uh, for such an approach like, uh, like the glioblastoma brain tumors, it, it's a must, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, Christian, this question is, did you perform an initial loading dose to reach steady state faster? Uh, I think that's obviously something you can do. Uh, it's easy. Um, to be honest, we haven't done that in our program so far. It was not necessary, but I'm aware that uh, for several other projects, obviously, this could be a very nice approach, especially in oncology, uh, in order to mitigate a little bit the, let's say, tolerability issues or maybe to get maximum efficacy uh, at the beginning and hopefully enough to kill the cells and then don't regrow afterwards. So, yes, this is feasible, but in my hands, uh, uh, to be honest, we have never done that, no. Okay, and Chung, this question is actually for you, I think. Um, do you know if the iPressio pumps are compatible with in vivo imaging systems? Uh, 
actually I'm not not sure on that. It depends on the in vivo imaging system. Uh, Christian, have you done some yourself? I remember in your first presentation, yeah, you yeah, did yeah, some yeah. luminescence. Yeah, so maybe what, what I can say is that obviously it's compatible with um, everything except uh, MRI. So if you have a magnet, you will have a problem. <laughs> um, but I think in order, uh, if you want to do some X-ray or if you want to do, uh, let's say, even some bioluminescence readouts and so on, this, this is not going to be deleterious, except that if the pump is in between your tumor in this case and your camera you will have a shielding which is not what you want but that's something which is easy to to to, to handle so i think uh, the only uh, limitation i see here is is the same as for telemetry for example you cannot go in a magnet with something with some uh, lead and metal inside because it will just kill your animal right that makes sense okay um, we've got lots more questions, so I'm going to keep going if you're okay with that. Um, People are this excited about that. <laughs> is, yeah. This question is, can you also implant these pumps for intraocular administration in rabbits or non-human primate eyes for glaucoma, AMD treatments, etc.? So my answer is clear. Yes, it's certainly feasible. Uh, I had uh, some in my career. I have done some intraocular pressure measurements with uh, radio telemetry in in rabbits, and I can tell you that uh, the same way I was inserting uh, my 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 sensor in the in in the vitreous of the eye, you could do it also with this pump. I don't see any any issue here, uh, but. To be honest, I have not done it myself. So that's something which um, I think is quite um, exciting to hear. And I, I would be happy to, to see such a publication in the future that uh, this was done. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think you kind of just answered this question, but I'll reiterate. Um, this person has asked if you've ever used um, these pumps in larger animals like ferrets and rabbits. Uh, not myself, no. I think, uh, as you know, oncology is 99% is mice and rats. Uh, so this is uh, my two species I'm dealing with daily, uh, and we have not used them uh, in other uh, species. Obviously, uh, all the tox department uh, for them is definitely different, and I'm sure they, are, they have maybe some experience on dogs. Uh, but obviously, given the size of these tracer pumps, they are designed for small animals. And this is exactly where I think uh, they have the biggest advantage uh, due to the size um, that we can really do some meaningful preclinical uh, work in mice and rats uh, with that. But I'm quite sure that uh, big animals are feasible. I don't know, Tsung, if you have some feedbacks on this. Yeah, they, they have been used in larger animals as well. Ferrets, um, I think I, I only know of one publication. Um, they've been used in rabbits, dogs, um, non-human primates, etc. So large animals, they do work as well. But of course, as you, you said, Christian, the, it depends on the flow rate, but they, they do work. Yep. Okay, fantastic. And we can share more information. Um, um, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, finish your thought there. Oh, we can share more information in the in on demand sec um, once we prepare the on demand section, so we can list out a few publications for larger animals. Okay, great. All right, um, before we move on to a couple more questions, I just wanted to let everybody know um, we do have a survey. So if you have to leave a couple minutes early, um, please th take the time to fill out that survey. We really appreciate your feedback there. All right, and uh, we're gonna continue with another question here. So Christian, this question is for you. Um, have you ever used the implantable pumps for intraperitoneal dosing? And if so, how did you secure the cannula in the abdomen? Again, a, a very good and specific question. Um, I have used the pumps for subcutaneous uh, delivery, uh, which is obviously easier uh, to secure the catheter. Um, I can only say from my experience that uh, if you want to use an intraperitoneal uh, infusion, that's certainly not uh, a problem. But I, what I would recommend is to really secure the tip of your infusion uh, catheter uh, to the abdominal wall. Uh, if not, I think you could have problems with uh, the intestines that you will have then maybe some, uh, let's say, uh, conjunctions or that the intestine is moving around around the catheter. So um, this, yeah, 
there is no point to get into trouble if you can solve it easily just by securing the catheter to the abdominal wall. Okay. Makes sense. All right. And I think just based on time, this is going to be our last question. Um, this question, well, first it's a comment. It says, thank you for the presentation. Uh, the question is, are there any behavioral changes between non-implanted and implanted animals that you've noticed, for example, in terms of locomotion or rearing performed by the mice or rats? Based on my experience, I would say nothing obvious, uh, at least by eye. Um, as I say, the only behavioral change you will see uh, just after implantation is that the animals will start to leak the wound. They will try to get rid of your knots, uh, but that's something which is not specific to Ipritio or to the pump. It's for any kind of surgery. Uh, but afterwards, uh, once they adapted or they went over this early phase, I have never seen any any kind of uh, changes uh, on, on this. And I think maybe a very good readout, which is also important, and this is thanks to the um, telemetry, is that we could also measure body temperature in this animal at the same time as blood glucose. And we have very nice to see that this diurnal rhythm in body temperature, which is higher during the night when they are active and lower when they are sleeping, uh, is coming back already after uh, five uh, after five days, meaning that the animals really recover about their normal physiological uh, cycles very rapidly. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, the behavior is fully normal. OK, fantastic. Well, um, I just want to extend another thank you, Christian, for all of your fantastic insights today. Um, and also to thank you, Chung, for your technical expertise here. It's a pleasure to have you both with us. With pleasure. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you very much.